Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Profiling Evil Live. We haven't uh, done a live in quite some time, so I thought I'd take advantage of a few minutes uh, freedom that I had right now over lunch to visit with you about the shooting in the Rust film and uh, the shooting by Alec Baldwin with uh, Helena Hutchins and Joel Souza, the, the two that were injured and uh, obviously Miss Hutchins uh, murdered in this particular case. Uh, that that was a tragic thing that a lot of you were asking questions about <clears throat> during the AMA on Monday night. So I thought we'd jump in. So please just uh, throw your questions up. I just wanted to answer questions and chat with you because I really didn't take much time on Monday night to do that. So Patricia, pause. Hello, Diane Campbell. How you doing? Looks like people are uh, starting to pop in and, and we'll uh, give them a couple of minutes. But uh, thanks so much for joining. Uh, it's uh, obviously very little notice, which is kind of something that I do. So um, Rita, nice to see you. Thank you. And Vicki Mara, thank you. Um, she watched the press conference. Was a little troubled by the DA and the reactions that the DA had. Uh, Liz Burton calling from in from South Oz. Uh, that's nice to see you, Liz. Thank you, Richard, Kathy Oltz, and everybody. Looks like people are starting to pull in. Uh, I suspect we'll have a few mods jump in to help out, so I'll just thank them in advance. And again, folks, uh, I want to just take advantage of this time to talk about the shooting on the Rust movie scene uh, by Alec Baldwin. If you remember, we'll just kind of go back and retrace what happened shortly after lunch last week uh, as the film crew was getting ready Alec Baldwin was going in and practicing for a scene that they were going to shoot and some peculiar things were going on uh, that are really important to this case I believe as this thing unfolds the, the first is that uh, there had been some uh, budgetary issues coming up so some uh, folks are suggesting that there were budget cuts and corner cutting that was going on. But regardless, there were apparently um, allegations of safety concerns, uh, concerns over hotel rooms not being paid for, the, the circumstances, uh, the way people were being treated on scene. And so there was a little bit of uh, unrest in the entire group. But the film crew that morning walked off, and and that was a, a union film crew, and so they quickly replaced them with a local team, and uh, were preparing to get filming again. At uh, one particular point, Alec Baldwin walked in. Uh, the assistant director uh, picked up a weapon that he received from the armorer, and uh, yelled out that it was a cold gun, indicating that it was a weapon with no ammunition in it, safe to shoot, and handed it to Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin uh, was practicing his cross draw, which I'll put my arm up here a little higher, is the old Western grabbing the weapon from the left-hand side for a right-handed person, pulling it across the body and pointing it. And in reality, was actually doing what I'm doing on the camera right now for all of you. He was pointing the weapon at the camera to get the camera angle that he wanted. And uh, at one point, he drew the weapon, pulled and pulled the trigger. And there was a live round in there that penetrated the camera and went into the chest of Helena um, Hutchins and exited through her body and caught the right shoulder of the uh, the director, uh, Joel Sousa. And uh, so she stumbled backward, complained of numbness in her legs, and then collapsed to the ground. And uh, Sousa, of course, fell from the gunshot wound as well. So what had happened is they were looking through the camera, trying to capture the shot and see what was going on. And, and of course, uh, there was a live round in the, in the weapon. So that was uh, very tragic. Do you, do you Jill, um, Max Martinez, I think it's an excellent question. Do you think somebody set up Alec? I, I, I don't know if anyone particularly set up Alec. One of the things that I think is going to be important to have come out in the course of the investigation is if there were any disgruntled people 
maybe even disgruntled union people who, when they chose to walk off, didn't do something to kind of send a message of how dangerous it really was, not intending that someone might get shot, but that someone might just shoot the gun in the air or something and and uh, scare the wits out of everybody. So that's going to be a real possibility that I think needs to be uh, explored. So how did uh, Baldwin actually hit the camera again, Joe, me? Uh, what what I'm uh, understanding from reading the documents and and uh, listening to those who have uh, spoken publicly is the um, Baldwin's right-handed, and I believe he's right-handed. He he cross drew the weapon. So if uh, my shoulders represented my waistline where a gun was strapped in, think of your old cowboy westerns. Uh, rather than reaching down and and uh, pulling the weapon up and pointing it this way. Uh, there's a cross draw where he cross drew across his body and then pointed. And they were trying to get this camera shot that I'm kind of portraying right now. And so uh, he was shooting right into the camera, thinking he was shooting a blank gun and just practicing what his gun draw would look like. And and then he uh, pulled the trigger, uh, which is really um, troubling knowing that there were two people directly behind the camera. So uh, I don't know how any film set can have live rounds. It's scary. Emma Booth. Uh, yeah, this, this is, uh, I don't know if you folks caught me on court TV last night, but I spent a lengthy amount of time with Vinnie Politan and Bobby Chacon uh, talking about this set. And the thing that uh, just sent shivers down my spine is I don't know of a police officer in the world, a member of the military in the world, anyone who uh, has gone through hunter safety, anyone who goes to a gun range on a regular basis that wasn't horrified by what happened and the safety protocols that it appears were on site. Uh, and and that's going to be the real question as this thing unfolds is is what were the protocols and and did things fall apart we'll have to just wait and see but there shouldn't have been live rounds on the set now some say they were out in the in the uh woods plinking uh on on their break plinking just shooting at pop cans and other kinds of things the sheriff acted like he hadn't confirmed that that happened in the press conference. So it'll be interesting to see if there really was plinking going on. But here's a troubling thing. They recovered, according to the sheriff, 500 rounds of ammunition, 500 bullets at the time they recovered the three weapons that they recovered. Demi Ray, have they recovered that footage that was shot for evidence? So I don't know that they were filming Demi. Uh, they were practicing. It was, it was pre-event. So it's very likely that there was no one filming. So uh, this is this is going to be interesting. Yeah, uh, Mama Bear, uh, the interesting thing about the uh, armorer is this was her first gig on her own. Uh, she had actually done a podcast just before this happened saying that she wondered if she should take the job because of her age, but, but uh, clearly had been working on other movie sets as an armorer. Uh, again, last night, as, as Bobby and I talked with Vinny, uh, I mean, you you got to keep in mind that two people handled that weapon before Alec Baldwin did. And those two people said it was an empty weapon, which means they didn't check it. Bottom line, they were, they were, they were lax in the safety protocols. But anyone who's been through uh, any hunter safety training, any one, a law enforcement officer, every weapon you pick up is a loaded weapon and it's incumbent upon the person who picks it up to clear that weapon and make sure that it's safe. And frankly, bottom line is you never point a weapon at anything that you don't intend to shoot. The, uh, guns are lethal and, uh, and it looks like a, a few things were really dropped in regard to this. <clears throat> So Rita, yeah, I would I would agree with you on that. I uh, I didn't know if you'd be interested, but I um, thought as we look at some of the questions that are that are coming in, that we would also talk about some of the questions about liability that might rise to the surface through this case. And uh, 
um, and this is a perfect segue, Erica, thank you. Do you think that they'll charge Alec? I can see both sides. So the question is, if, if uh, Alec Baldwin, if you were to think about charging him, you would have to say that he had criminal intent, intent in his mind to uh, cause that kind of bodily uh, harm. Now, it could, from a criminal perspective, step over the threshold of uh, a negligent event where you should have known. And uh, again, that goes back to that question of, of uh, should he have cleared that weapon, even though two people told him before that, that it was clear. So that's going to be um, uh, a big question about whether there's some negligence there that led to the homicide. We clearly know there's negligence that led to the homicide because there were weapons uh, that, that were loaded on the scene. And uh, so, so that, that's going to be interesting. Now, um, thinking about whether Alec Baldwin could be charged, um, perhaps he couldn't be charged as intentionally causing the death of another person, negligently possibly. But then you have to think about the fact that he wasn't, this, this was Alec, the actor who pulled the trigger, but he was also the producer of this film. So he has a overreaching responsibility to it. Uh, this the director, uh, Sousa, uh, he had responsibility over decisions that were making that were being made there. So if they made a decision that they were going to cut corners and allow this kind of um, negligence to occur, then there may be some real heavy civil civil penalties that come their way because they made the decision to uh, quit filming with a union team. Uh, they had people that they were in charge of that they, if they had anything to do with this plinking of rounds that was going on or other things, then somebody could come back and say potentially they should have known better and uh, and sue them civilly. And undoubtedly, there's going to be some huge civil suits. I mean, already we're seeing uh, Garagos and and, uh, and Gloria stepping up and others stepping up to investigate and, and represent in this case. So um, that that's going to be an interesting thing. I thought it was also interesting that the movie company made a point of saying, hey, we're going to just pause for a while, but we're not going away. Um, again, this, uh, it's going to be an interesting thing to see how they, uh, handle that. So, uh, let's see Southern Sass. Nice to see you. Thank you. Um, wasn't there a young girl responsible for the gun before handing it over? So again, that goes back to the armorer who, uh, she's 24 years old. You can look up her name if, if you want at this point, I'm, I'm like, why, but, um, the armor and the assistant director both handled that weapon beforehand. And there were three weapons that uh, law enforcement seized. Uh, they they took the uh, weapon that, now I think about these old uh, spaghetti westerns, the, the uh, weapon that uh, Baldwin shot and uh, killed Hutchins with and wounded Sousa with was a 45 caliber, the old uh, gun with revolver that you see him spinning the the chamber and and uh, the old western looking colt revolver it wasn't a colt by the way but it was a, a replica and uh and they the sheriff has indicated that he believes that that is the weapon that killed her uh, they also recovered a single action uh, modified army pistol that uh they don't and when they say modified, that makes me wonder that perhaps it was one that was set to accept blanks, but not full rounds. And that certainly is the safer thing to do on a set. Use a blank uh, that a, a regular round, which is going to be this big on that kind of a gun, a blank will be this big. Uh, put that blank in and not allow a full size round to go in that weapon. Um, but they recovered that. And then they recovered a plastic firearm uh, that they used. And incidentally, law enforcement recovered, uh, they said, over 600 pieces of evidence, including, again, the three firearms and the 500 rounds of ammunition. So uh, kind of interesting. Amanda's asking, does negligence require proof of criminal intent? So that's the beauty is, is uh, um, negligence will give them this ability to say they should have known better. Uh, versus that this was intentional and, and planned out. 
And again, Amanda, I, th I think this is going to be interesting. The question that's kind of just grinding in the back of my mind is, uh, did some disgruntled participant in this whole group of people that were there filming, perhaps those who were walking off the job, happen to put a round in there to send a message? Now, what we do know is that immediately after the weapon was fired, the armorer, this young woman, did in fact unload the weapon uh, so before police got there, they ended up with a weapon that had been unloaded, but they've been able to recover the, the, uh, cartridge it's, or the casing itself, the, the metal piece that, uh, looks like a little barrel. Um, they were able to, during surgery, remove the, uh, bullet from the shoulder of Sousa. So we know that, and, and this was what was kind of troubling to me last night when everyone was saying, well, we don't know what was fired in there. Holy cow. It went through Hutchins' body, and it went into the shoulder of Sousa. Uh, a, a piece of wadding doesn't penetrate the body. Uh, those old lead-nosed bullets in the 45s of the West will go right through a body. So uh, that all made sense as we looked at this whole thing and, and kind of thought through this. Leslie's asking, uh, I've read that even blanks are dangerous. Absolutely, a blank is still gunpowder and it's still covered with a wadding and it still projects or or expels debris out of the barrel so what a what a blank will do is give you the muzzle blast it will give you the smoke it will give you a look that something was projected out and if someone's close enough then that paper wadding or other things could, you know, get into their eyes. If they're close enough, it could actually penetrate their skin and get into their body. But uh, blanks are dangerous, but bullets are deadly. Yeah, thanks, Leslie. Will fingerprints be able to be recovered? You know what, that's a such a cool question, Emma, because yes, in fact, um, if, uh, if someone wasn't thinking and it was intentional to put that bullet in there and put that weapon there, then there could be a fingerprint because those casings on a 45 are, uh, I mean, they're, they're big about the size of your index finger in diameter. And, uh, and again, they're, they're going to be a inch to an inch and a half long. Uh, they're a, <laughs> it's a big bullet in those old 45s. And so there's a lot of space for a fingerprint to land. If in fact that happened now, um, we'll, we'll, that'll be interesting to see. <coughs> Uh, Jennifer, what are the chances that Alex is going to be charged with a crime? The sheriff made it very clear today that at this stage, it's too early for them to determine if criminal charges will come forward. I think undoubtedly there will be some civil charges, some civil uh, uh, remedies requested. Um, but theoretically, there could be a charge of uh, negligent uh, homicide and uh It'll be interesting to see. Now, there also may be criminal charges of violating uh, New Mexico laws in regard to having weapons on a scene or other kinds of things. So um, Lisa Tilby is saying it was reported the gun misfired previously. I, I don't know. I mean, those old those old weapons, if it was a replica, it was a newer weapon to look old, or if it's an older one, uh, the, the question about misfiring is if you think about um, – if you know anything about weapons, there's a thing called a firing pin. So on that big hammer that they pull back on the revolver in those old Westerns, you see a little kind of needly thing pointing out on the back of that hammer they pull back. When they fire the round, that little needle point goes into what's called a primer on the bottom of the, uh, of the weapons uh, bullet. And uh, that primer explodes and makes a little ignition of fire that ignites the gunpowder inside of the the bullet casing and then of course the intense pressure of that gunpowder exploding with nowhere to go is what projects the the uh, bullet out out the barrel so that i don't know if that helps or not so um Anyway, uh, so this is going to be interesting. Uh, I think uh, it's going to be really interesting in the coming days to see at what point uh, Baldwin and others quit talking to law enforcement and then just start uh, following um, advice of attorneys. But right now, according to the sheriff, they are assisting in the investigation. They're answering all the questions. 
The district attorney confirmed that. Uh, again, to, to step back, um, it was it was really clear that the armorer, the 24-year-old woman, and the assistant director, who incidentally had had problems on other movie sets, uh, handled the weapon first and declared that it was empty, unloaded, cold, and handed it to Baldwin, who <clears throat> didn't check the weapon and fired it. So what does it mean when the gun misfired? Again, it goes back to that idea that on the bottom of a bullet casing, the bullet that goes inside of the weapon, there's a little primer, and that little primer has to be struck by a pin, a firing pin, they call it, on the hammer of the weapon. So when they pull the trigger, that hammer pulls back and then flips forward really fast. As it goes forward, that hammer will hit into the bottom of the shell casing where a primer is, and that primer explodes, the gunpowder explodes, and then the bullet is projected out of the weapon. So should inflatable handcuffs be mandatory? Man, Julie, I, I don't know. And, and uh, if they were used in this case, I don't know. I've never heard of an inflatable handcuff. I've heard of flex cuffs or I've heard of using uh, little wire um, bands to, to uh, hold people. But, um, boy, you got me on that one. Julie Rock, I wonder if the new crew was properly vetted and was their time. So that's going to be one of these really important questions that is going to put pressure back on Baldwin and Sousa and other decision makers is when the union guys walked away because of what is being reported as safety issues, did they sit down and retool everything or did they just say, hey, let's hurry and try to get some other shooting done and avoid losing even more money on this thing. And, uh, and of course, then it's going to tell us whether there was enough time. And uh, it, it would appear to me that there certainly wasn't enough time taken in changing over the teams. So let's see. Inflatable cuffs for the gun to prevent loading anything. Oh, uh, Julia, is that something that goes inside the bear, uh, the chamber? So that on the, on a revolver, you have six or five bullets that fit in the individual holes. And each time you pull the trigger back, the chamber ro revolves. That's why they call it a revolver. And you, I, I'm wondering if you're suggesting something inside there. And I'm, um, gosh, I, I've, I've never uh, considered that. Bottom line is, a weapon that is uh, capable of firing shouldn't be used in playtime. It, it's it's weapons are for shooting, and shooting results in dying if you're hit by bullets. And uh, holy cow, there are weapons where, like I said, they have shortened that area that you put the bullet or the round into so that only blanks could go in, not a real bullet. Uh, that is one way of managing it. They talked about the fact that they had plastic weapons. Uh, and, of course, Hollywood is the master at, I mean, if we can make a lightsaber look uh, real, we ought to be able to make a gunshot look real without putting a real gun out there. Just crazy. Barb Q, has Baldwin said the words, I'm sorry? I think he has made it very clear how devastated he is. And, and again, I don't think for a moment that Alec Baldwin intended on this happening. This, there may have been um, things that were done recklessly, but I don't think for the life of me that he intended on that to happen. Uh, hey, Melissa, how are you? Are there specific waivers that need to be signed when using firearms? I, I would suspect that, that uh, people involved in uh, these movies, everything I've ever been involved in, I've had to sign my life away. Uh, so I would suspect that they, uh, have got some, um, something to indemnify them. But bottom line is if in fact, all of this sounds like it's being reported in some degrees, then they've stepped way over the line. And that would say <laughs> that's, that's more than a reasonable person should be able to sign off on. Kelly, uh, shouldn't someone have physically checked the gun? Oh, man, 
how did the assistant director know it was a cold gun? But both excellent questions, Kelly. Number one, absolutely. How can you say it's cold when you haven't inspected it personally and said it's cold? How do two people say it's an unloaded weapon? I'm still boggled. Why on earth is a low a weapon, a functional weapon on a movie set being pointed at other people? In law enforcement, we don't even train that way. We don't we don't train with a live weapon. Now we fire live weapons at the range and at the and and we practice in hot houses. But when we're doing uh, training things, uh, acting out guns being pulled on officers and stuff, there is no way we're using a weapon that could actually be used live. Um, it just uh, it just is frightening to think about that, and uh, there's just no place for that. So, um, <clears throat> would the company be able to collect insurance? Thanks, June Cummings, since there was issues going on. Well, you know what? I think those are all the questions that are going to come out as we watch this thing unfold in the press uh, and in the courts in the years to come. And uh, gosh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. I mean, b- bottom line is uh, <laughs> um, Bobby Chacon last night, on court TV with me talked about the fact that he has actually been on a number of movie sets providing that work as the safety officer. And he said, I, it was, it was, uh, they were so sick of me saying, don't point a gun, don't do this, don't do that. That he said they would start mouthing what I was going to say before I could even say it, which to him meant that my message was getting across gun safety is important. Uh, and again, they're introducing live bullets into this thing somehow, how how they got there, why there's a box of 500 rounds sitting there somewhere, uh, is just incredible. Ruth Mobley intention does not excuse reality. Does it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Oh, but for good intention, Really, really tragic. Um, I didn't know if you'd be interested. I uh, I grabbed the uh, actual uh, search warrant for that facility, and a couple of things that <clears throat> that I thought were kind of interesting that I would just while I'm waiting for questions to come in and pop up. <clears throat> excuse me. Is uh, again uh, during the filming of the movie, the direct assistant director grabbed one of three prop guns. So somehow, this this loaded weapon was sitting on a stack of guns that they used as props. Uh, That weapon had also been set up and placed there by this 24 year old armorer and was sitting on the cart. Now the problem is they say, and this is really important. I don't know if anybody's picked up on this. The cart was left outside the structure due to COVID-19 restrictions. Well, I don't know how the, the cart and the weapons are going to give somebody COVID but if this thing is out of your visual pers- uh, view and control, then it isn't a cleared weapon. It's cleared when you look through it and say, I've looked through it and here's a cleared weapon. So that's really troubling to me that this thing sat outside where anyone would have had access. And they said there were 16 people there at the time it happened, but how many were there at other points throughout the morning before the other film crew left and other kinds of things. That's, this is really, really troubling to me is uh, the cart was left outside due to COVID-19. Uh, the assistant director yelled cold gun indicating that the gun didn't have any rounds in it. And uh, <clears throat> the prop gun was then used by uh, Baldwin who was practicing his scene and uh, fired and, and killed uh, Hutchins. Uh, this, this again, uh, not the best scenario, but I can kind of envision the armorer doing that. Once the shooting occurred, the armorer took the gun and removed uh, the ammunition from the gun. So was it six cylinders that had ammunition in them? Was it only one? And this was a bizarre event. Um, what, what was the circumstance there? And that's going to be interesting to find out. Uh, they talk about the fact that they took Baldwin's clothes and and a lot of other evidence, which is just normal in these kinds of things. 
but uh and then they uh the officer once he took a, a custody of that weapon was able to show uh in evidence how he moved that weapon around anyway this is uh, online if you're interested in reading it and uh, can give you maybe a little more insight into that. So um, let's uh, let's just see if there are any other questions and and uh, and talk a little more about it and then we'll call it a day. I wanted to make sure that we did this. Uh, you can go out to YouTube and find the press conference from today and be able to watch uh, how the sheriff and the DA handled that. Uh, they, the sh press conference in in reality was relatively short. It's difficult to hear some of the questions being asked by people in the uh, body of media that are there, but the answers kind of clarify what that question should be. So you might find some things that are interesting. I didn't find anything that really uh, jumped out at me during that <clears throat> other than, isn't it cool as this uh, social media world and true crime community is having such an impact that we see DAs and sheriffs that are stepping up and doing a press conference sooner than later so that uh, more information can be shared. Let's see what Donald Lehman says here. I'm sure Alec has handled guns on sets in the past. Why would he not check his gun, check the gun himself? So, uh, Donald, that's going to be a really interesting question. Again, I mean, I think of um, my uh, sons. I think of when I was learning how to handle weapons as a child, uh, and frankly, as a child, I did learn. I mean, you, you you got to go out with the adults and shoot, and you learned how dangerous these things are. Then, the many, many years I spent on the range at the police department, I was on the, the competitive pistol team for the police department, have shot literally hundreds of thousands of rounds of ammunition through weapons. Why you would never clear a weapon yourself, regardless of where it had been. I, I even, uh, when I go to clean a weapon uh, that I take out of my gun safe that I know I put in there empty, I still take that weapon and I open it up and I clear it entirely before I do anything with it. And, uh, and so it just really is boggling my mind uh, why that didn't happen. Bobby Preston, did they do a drug and alcohol check after this happened? I'm sure they they are uh, doing all of those tests uh, and uh, and will continue to investigate that very clearly. So um, anyway, folks, uh, it, let, let's just see if there's uh, one or two more questions and then uh, we'll wrap up. I, again, wanted to do this because during our Ask Mike Anything on Monday night, uh, the question came up on this. I had been flying all night from Europe and uh, frankly, was catching little bits and pieces of this case on uh, the news and didn't really have a chance to, to speak to it. Last night, uh, doing court TV with Vinnie Politan, I, I uh, talked about the case extensively. And, uh, and interestingly, uh, a uh, construction vehicle hit the power grid for court TV's uh, electrical panel. And so uh, the the uh, audio was really wonky on there. So I wanted to take advantage of this to also uh, just reflect on some things that I said then. Again, I think this case is really going to boil down to a couple of really important parts. Number one, how did that bullet end up in the weapon? If this weapon was left outside, who would have had access to it? And to me, this is goofy to say because of COVID, we're going to keep guns outside of the building we're using them in. Uh, now, now, there may be really good reasons for that. I don't know. But who would have had access to that weapon to put the bullets in there? Were they, in fact, doing practice shooting during the lunch break? And if so, was it possible that the weapons that were being used out there to fire live rounds at beer cans or pop cans or tin plates or whatever they were shooting at were somehow then transferred back to the movie set and nobody cleared them? How on earth do two people, the armorer who is assigned weapon safety and the, uh, the assistant director able to, to say that weapon is clear and ready to be used in an acting situation when in fact it has a full uh, one at least round inside of it? That's really troubling. Did the bullet end up in there by mistake 
or was it put there intentionally by someone trying to prove a point because of all of the allegations that were coming out about safety on the set? It's a question I think needs to be answered. And again, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just saying as an investigator, these are the questions that I would want to start answering. What uh, kinds of things were said immediately by Baldwin when this happened? What, what, was there anything that was rehearsed or was it clear that this was a responsive kind of a comment made? Uh, and, and then again, um, is there going to be um, a criminal charge of something like uh, negligence or some New Mexico law? Or is it possible that uh, this this movie production set and everyone involved, including uh, Baldwin personally and Sousa personally, uh, going to be sued civilly? And it won't be interesting if Sousa tries to sue anyone having a leadership role that he had in there. Um, this this whole thing is going to be really interesting to see unfold. Uh, so we'll learn more as time goes. I want to thank you all so much for jumping on. I hope you have a great day, and I'll look forward to seeing you Monday night for choir practice and Ask Mike Anything. So uh, until we talk again, uh, please uh, take care, and I'll look forward to seeing you at the next crime scene. Mm-hmm.